Namaskar and welcome to In Focus. Tonight, in part two of our exclusive interview with former Home Minister Indrajit Gupta, he tells us about his experiences as Home Minister for 10 months, his experiences of being part of a coalition, his assessment of himself, his assessment of former Prime Minister Deva Gowda, and most importantly, how he thinks such coalitions can learn to function more effectively and efficiently in the future. Mr. Gupta, I want to talk in this part of the interview about your experience in government. Given that you've been a leader of the opposition for the best part of your career, how difficult did you find it to transform from an opposition leader to not just the Home Minister, but to the number two person in the administration? I found it very difficult. Why? Well, because, uh, as you said, for the uh, most part of my life, I have been a, not a question of an opposition leader, I have been a a uh, mass worker, you see. Uh, I have not been a minister or part of the administration and I have certainly not uh, had to function within a, within a sort of system which has been laid down from before. Before I found it very difficult. I was a free soul before that. Were you happy as Home Minister or did you feel straight jacketed and constrained? Very much straight jacketed in a maze of rules and regulations and uh, various kinds of uh, things laid down which you have to follow. Give us an example so we can understand. What are the sort of constraints that irked you? Well, they're mostly dealing with um, administrative uh, methods of uh, handling things or personnel. The main thing is personnel, which includes officers and includes uh, others also. You should know that the bulk of the work the Home Minister is expected to do, routine work, is handling of appointments, promotions, transfers of individual. It took me months to understand these procedures, you see, because they don't follow, they don't always follow very uh, well-defined principles. I mean, they're uh, arbitrary at times. They're ad hoc. You know, you said a moment ago that you were a free soul before you became Home Minister. Do you think some of the freedom you enjoyed previously, you should have shed much more quickly? What I'm really referring to is the fact that you got a lot of flack for what people said was putting your foot in your mouth. That is thanks to the media. Okay, I accept that a lot of fault is the media because they find the tactless part of what you said and play it up. But for your own part, do you regret being so outspoken at times? No. Is there anything that you regret saying? Uh, anything I said? Yeah, that you now regret? No, except that if one or in one or two cases I said something inadvertently which hurts the feelings of uh, people, I am sorry for that, surely. What about two comments that you made as Home Minister? You said at one point that tourists perhaps ought not to visit Kashmir and at another point you in fact questioned the validity of the elections held in Kashmir. You were Home Minister at the time. That was a little tactless, wasn't it? I never questioned the validity of elections. So you were misquoted? Well, I don't remember this quote, but I certainly never said that. Did you ever advise tourists against visiting Kashmir? At that time, yes. It was just after those uh, foreign tourists had been uh, kidnapped. It was after some Indian tourists had been killed. It was a year after the foreign tourists were kidnapped. No, they were kidnapped no, in 95. The Indian tourists, they were, but then why was there so much consternation? being expressed by due to the fact that these pe there was no news of these people. Whether so what you're saying is you were being sensible in giving this advice, not being tactless. I didn't say that they should not go. I said they ought to uh, be careful about going there without any precautions. So you stand by those statements? There's, There's nothing wrong in that. What is wrong in that? Do you think it's, the media was unfair to you? If, yes. If somebody wanted to take the risk of being killed or kidnapped, well, I can't prevent them. But it's my duty as Home Minister to give them a friendly warning. So that's an instance where you suffered at the hands of the media who played you up out of context. Media thought that by making a statement like that, I was uh, querying the pitch as far as uh, elections were concerned. And you were doing nothing of the sort? Not at all. You were simply giving sensible advice? Yes. Okay, what about another instance? During the end of your tenure as Home Minister, at the end of a BJP speech criticizing the situation in UP, you referred to the situation as Anarchy, chaos, and destruction. Heading towards destruction. But was that tactless? No. You said it in seeming 
agreement with the BJP position on the subject. Not BJP position. You will please read the records of the debate in the Rajya Sabha following my statement and see what uh, the overwhelming majority of members said, including congressmen. They all agreed with Including you. the president of the U UP Congress Committee. They all agreed with you. Yes, yeah, they said we agree fully with what he has said. But at the time, UP was under president's rule and therefore so, directly under your charge. So? So was it a fitting thing for you to say about the state of affairs under your charge? Well, it was the truth. That, that was what was happening. And I had explained it also later that anarchy meant political anarchy. Was there not political anarchy? Is it always fitting for the Home Minister to be so outspoken with the truth? Was there not social chaos? And what about destruction? There was that too. I said heading towards destruction. But, but the question that people raised was a simple one. Was it fitting for the Home Minister to be so outspoken with the truth? But that's for the public to judge. That's for the electorate to judge. I have received many kinds of reactions. And most of them were saying that we are very happy that you were so outspoken. Your colleague, CPI General Secretary A.B. Baldwin said to us in an interview that if he'd been in your position, he probably would not have used those words. But later on, I may inform you, Mr. Thapar, that <laughs> Mr. Baldwin has said that he's now of the opinion that what he said in his interview to you was wrong. Ah. He came to you and said... He didn't come to me. It was discussed in a meeting of our party secretariat. And after that, he wrote to me saying that what he had said in his interview to you was perhaps not correct. In other words, he apologized to you. But the other words, it's up to you to define. But he definitely changed his position. He said that. Or maybe what was reported in the press, I didn't watch your... I didn't actually here or watch the TV uh, recording. I'm afraid as far as Mr. Bardhan is concerned, what was reported in the press is exactly what he said in the interview. Maybe. So it's all right. <laughs> but he definitely went back on his position. Now that's news to us. Okay. Let me then try and conclude this by saying the press said that Indrajit Gupta was sometimes outspoken, often tactless, occasionally even a little thoughtless, in that he'd shoot by the lip. You're telling me that's really not the case, that you were often quoted out of context by a media that's trying to play you up unfairly. That is my opinion, but I do not uh, object to other people expressing a different opinion. No, that's one of the great things about you, that you never take umbrage, but, no, but, you're, not, a, but, you're, not conceding, but you're not conceding that there was ever a moment when you should have spoken differently or perhaps not spoken at all. You're not conceding that. Well, that, that is irrespective of what the media or anybody else may say. What I myself have said, whether it was right or whether I should not have said it, is for me to think about. You did, of course, earlier in part two of this interview, accept that some of the things you said about the Congress party, in retrospect, you wish you hadn't said. Those which they took as a kind of uh, uh, you know, affront to them. So that part, at least, you regret, but that's about it. That Nothing more. No. Okay, then let's move to another aspect of the functioning of the United Front government that you were such a prominent part of. You know, in any government, one of the critical relationships is that between the Prime Minister and the Home Minister. And perhaps this is more so in India than in any other country. But can you now accept that in your government there were problems and perhaps they weren't always successfully overcome? But do you expect there will be no problems? Mm -hmm. in, a, in a government of this kind which has been constituted for the first time and in which these posts which you are referring to. Is that to. a rhetorical way of accepting there were problems? Why should there not be problems? We are not afraid of problems. No, I mean problems in the relationship between Home Minister and Prime Minister. That's one area in which problems express themselves. Can you, because I, this, is, this is an interview that I'd like to be, in a sense, a record of your time. So explain to me, what sort of problems were there? Mostly problems of communication. Because he wouldn't talk, you wouldn't talk, you couldn't meet. What was, I mean, why were there problems with communication? Yes, very often when we should have met, we were not able to meet, either because of uh, uh, there being lack of uh, time, either mine or his. Was there occasionally a lack of willingness to meet? No, I can't say that. Not on your part at any rate? I can't say that. Tell me something, was it just lack of communication or was it also to do with styles of functioning? Maybe, maybe. Styles of functioning are also very important, I agree. What about personalities? Were you two different personalities that perhaps find it difficult to get on? That's for you to judge. 
No, but you were one of the personalities, my, so you know. My background, my political background, my social background and everything, very different to Mr. Devagaudas. He has come from, you know what, from where he came. And naturally you can't expect that he and I would always be on the same wavelength. So all three had a critical input into this relationship? It could have, after all. Uh, such things, uh, and he had a hell of a difficult job, I must say. If there was one thing, with hindsight, that you wish you'd done to ensure this relationship was better, can you name it? Uh, well, in that case, I would have had to assert myself much more than I naturally uh, normally do. You wish you had? No, sometimes I wish I had, sometimes I think it would not have been wise. Give me an example where you think you wish you had asserted yourself. Well, there are many areas in which I was informed, I don't know, because I've never worked in this kind of job before. I was informed by others who should know better, including some bureaucrats, senior bureaucrats, that in such and such a field, what you decide is final. What you decide is law. What you decide is the final word. But what would happen? But uh, sometimes I found I couldn't uh, push things through according to this uh, uh, perception. Who stopped you? The PM? Not always the PM. But was, sometimes? Sometimes the PM, sometimes not for stop me, but just uh, uh, didn't act according to that. That's it for part one, but don't go away. We'll be back with part two in just a couple of moments. Welcome back to part two of our interview with former Home Minister Indrajit Gupta. Let me give you an example that the press brought up. They said there were certain important instances when you as Home Minister were not consulted. One was said to be the appointment of the UP Governor Ramesh Bhandari, the other was said to be the Home Secretary's extension. As far as I have understood, even up to today, it is not the Home Minister's prerogative to select the people for Governor's appointments. It's not the Home no, Minister's no, prerogative? No, 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 it is not. He can certainly suggest names, he can certainly give his opinion on names which are being proposed, but uh, the, it is ultimately the concurrence of the Prime Minister which is vital. So you weren't in any sense overlooked or sideways stepped over this issue? UP Governor? Yeah. Actually, we had conveyed to him, my party had conveyed and I had conveyed that the name which was being proposed was not to our liking. That much we had done. Ah, so he actually chose a man in seeming defiance of his own Home Minister's wishes. Well, uh, Mr. Thapar, you are very skillful in the use of words, but I am just stating the plain truth that some name had come up which we were not very favorably disposed to, and that was conveyed to him. And when he still insisted upon choosing this person, Ramesh Bhandari, did you protest? No. Do you think you should have? Publicly, no. But what about privately within the cabinet? Well, we, were, we had said because we were not the only people. But did you privately protest? We don't normally in cabinet meetings go about protesting. But he knew very well because I believe that uh, he was influenced in his choice. Who by? Maybe by some of your Congress friends. I don't wish to name them. That's a fairly sad indictment of a non-Congress Prime Minister that maybe, he can be maybe, influenced by the Congress. Maybe. So it but was a, uh, a regrettable instance. Mr. Ramesh Bandari, as you know, is, uh, was very much a Congressman. And he has good friends in the Congress, no doubt. And uh, they would be recommending his name. But you've also spoken of an instance where the Prime Minister was influenced against the wishes of his Home Minister into making a choice for UP Governor that you clearly think is the wrong choice. Yes, why should he not? It's his uh, final choice is his. Yes, but one doesn't like to have Prime Ministers you who get influenced into the wrong decisions. You may think it wrong, others may not think it wrong. You think it's wrong too. I think it's wrong. What about the extension of the Home Secretary? That happened not just behind your back when you were on a plane to Moscow, but I'm told you had been specifically told before your departure that it wasn't going to happen. Isn't that right? No. That's not correct. Who would say that to me? Well, members of the left front, but let's not bring them into it because they spoke in confidence. No. Why don't you set the record straight? Please set the record straight. 
Before I left, we had a discussion. The Prime Minister was present, I was present, the Cabinet Secretary was present, and uh, I said that I am on principle opposed to giving extensions to senior officers who have completed their tenure. Not a case only of the Home Secretary, because I feel that this is a method which uh, has a negative effect on other officers and demoralizes them. So uh, he should not be given an extension. What did the Prime Minister say? Prime Minister said, in general, I agree with you. But uh, in view of the situation through which our country is passing at the moment, uh, we should look for somebody who has had adequate experience of handling home ministry affairs because of all this trouble in the Northeast and other places and so on. How did you interpret that answer? Was that a sign that he was going to extend Padmana Bhaiya's tenure or was that a sign that he was going to look for a suitable man? No, so I asked him, I said, surely the other people are available? Other suitable people can be found? Why not we look for them? What did he say? Then he said that, uh, no, but this man has had a uh, lot of experience and uh, all right, then what we'll do is we won't give him an extension immediately. And it was recorded also that he should continue until further orders. Later on, that was changed into a formal order of extension after some weeks. But again, after consulting you or without consulting you? Which one? The changing into a proper extension no, for a year. I think he didn't think it was necessary to consult me further on that. Despite the fact that he had a previous agreement with you not to give a formal extension but just to let him carry on till further orders. He never said that he agreed there should be no extension. But this was the way he uh, wanted to redefine it. Do you think he was completely straightforward with you in the handling of Padmanabhaya's different extensions? Yeah, I would rather not make comments on such uh, matters. But he's straightforward. That was how he felt. To a lot of other people, it looks as if he may have been a little devious. It's your, your choice, Mr. Thapar. Okay, let's come to the last part of what I want to talk to you about. The functioning of the United Front as a coalition. <coughs> now, clearly, you've seen the Prime Minister at close quarters, and equally clearly, he didn't have the experience for the job, as you've already said in part two of our interview. But how much did he learn during the course of the 10 months? And did he rise to the occasion as you would have liked him to rise? You see, this, uh, there are both positive and uh, negative features in the situation. You can't make a sweeping, generalized uh, verdict. You can't give like that. During this period, you see, he as Prime Minister took many initiatives which were very, very important for the coalition government. You mean the budget and Pakistan? Not talks. budget, not budget. He's the first Prime Minister who visited Kashmir four times before the elections there. Narasimha Rao never went to Kashmir even once, knowing that the estrangement of the people there, their alienation from the central government, the mere fact that a Prime Minister of India went four times and spoke to the people, met them and all that, was a very positive thing. And the elected representatives of Kashmir tell us now that never have the people of Kashmir felt so much closer to the centre central government, then now because of this. Okay, so those would be... All right, then he went for one full week to the northeast. Yes. Then no other prime minister has because done Because he it did before. it during a time when there was a telephone worker strike and for a whole week it wasn't solved sure. because the prime minister was absent. No, he, that his program had been decided long before and he went, he visited all the states, seven states of the northeast. All right, let's say his great strengths was that he was a man who did a lot of traveling and he did it to the right states at the right time. Uh, Contact with the people is a very important uh, part of leadership. I don't deny it. Is that how history is going to record him? That he was a Prime Minister who went out of his way to make contact with the people. Is that your verdict? That's one of the things. I'm not the writer of history. No, but you're a reflective man. You see? You're a reflective That's man. That's one of the important things which he did. Okay. What would you say were his weaknesses? Well, you know, he has not had much of a... Uh, grounding in economics, I should say, except that he 
uh, certainly knows quite a lot about uh, uh, the problems of the farmers, agricultural problems. Otherwise, about other aspects of the economy, I don't think he had much uh, grounding or knowledge. And therefore, on these matters, he was not able to take many initiatives or give any leadership on that. And that Did was he get influenced by people who knew better economics than him? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe he was influenced. What I'm actually getting at is, did Chidambaram push him into a budget that otherwise he might not have agreed to? Well, whether he would have agreed to or not, I don't know. But he seems to be very happy with Chidambaram's budget and was congratulating him all the time. Okay. If lack of knowledge of economics was one weakness, what would you say were his other weaknesses? Other weaknesses? Well, uh, I must say he did well in foreign affairs also. But then he had Gujarat to fall back Yes, on. true. But his visits abroad were highly successful. Except that he did create local controversies by the size of the family entourage that he took along. That's another point, different point altogether. <laughs> okay, but come back. If lack of knowledge grounding your phrase in economics is one weakness, what are the others? Well, it depends on what you expect a prime minister to do. He's on, say, eight months or nine months, not such a hell of a long time. He was there for a short time, but I should say his basic weakness was this uh, inability to uh, devise norms and uh, procedures for handling the functioning of a coalition. Coalition is not one party. We have been having one party rule for most of the time, for 50 years, close on 50 years. And did that prevent that single party from did he fail to devise these norms because he didn't know how to or because he didn't realize that he had to? That I can't say, but then uh, you must see that in a situation like this, he would have to depend very much on the advice of the topmost bureaucrats who surround him. And they failed him? But they, he must have been acting according to their advice, I presume. And so in the Rajya Sabha, he has stated that the officers, the bureaucrats, are very often not allowing things to be done. That's right. But then was that a fitting thing for the Prime Minister to say after it was quoted by the Congress party several times not in several criticism times of him? Not several times quoted by Sitaram Kesri alone. And Karunakar, in an interview to us, he said that this is a Prime Minister who's clearly incompetent, his words not mine, because he's publicly admitting that his bureaucrats won't listen to him. Well, it's not bad to publicly admit things. It shows the basic honesty of the man. Would you want to continue as Home Minister in a new government? Well, it's up to the new Prime Minister no, to decide. No, but I'm asked absolutely, but it's up to you to say no. What's your wish? If I have to remain in the government, depending on my party's decision, I would prefer to have a change of portfolio. But if, uh, what sort of portfolio would you aspire to? No, this is too much, uh, this is too uh, uh, constrained, if I may say, within a certain bureaucratic system. Something which is less bureaucratic and gives you less, uh, more scope for uh, uh, taking initiatives on your own, I would prefer. Give me an example of the sort of industry you have in mind. Name two or three so that you're not been pointed to one. There are so many. Such as? But I would not express a marked preference for one or the other because I've never worked in this system at all. But you want an economic ministry? I would not mind. Finance minister? Hmm? Finance minister? No, no, that's a bit beyond me. <laughs> but commerce, industry? Commerce, industry, labor, there are so many things. On that note, Mr. Indrajit Gupta, Thank you very much for having spent so much time talking so openly to Infocus. And that's it for part two of this interview from the home of Mr. Indrajit Gupta, still our Home Minister in New Delhi. Goodbye.